Um, so a movie um, sequel that you probably have seen or might have seen, it was one of the highest grossing movies ever, and that, and that was Avatar. Um, hand up if you've seen Avatar 2. Okay. And hand up, I'm surprised, I'll be interested to see who, who saw Avatar 1 as well. Oh, even more have seen Avatar 1. Well, in Avatar, you've got this guy called Scully and, um, and Scully. Anyway, he, in the first movie, he's got a handicap or a disability. And what happens is he, you know, goes to Pandora, and he's meant to be fighting against these um, native people. But in the end, he becomes friends with them, and he eventually actually um, puts his consciousness into an avatar or, or like another body. And when, as before, he couldn't walk, now he can run even faster than you know a, a human can run. And the, the idea is kind of like your who you are, your soul, or the essence of who you are is within. And so the body doesn't really matter. It's okay for you to move from one body to another um, because who you are is really who you are on the inside. And I think today, that's really how we generally talk about what it means to be ourselves. Um, you are who you are on the inside, how you feel. And so hands up if you can remember a movie that talks about trying to find your true self or you being the hero of the story, hands up if you can think of a, a movie, maybe a Disney movie, where it's all about being true to yourself. Can you think of one? Can you name one? Can anyone name a movie like that? Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo, okay. Yeah? Huh? Mulan, yeah. Mulan, like that. any other movies you can think of? Spider-Man? I don't know about that. Frozen over here? Huh? Um, it's all about Trump being true to yourself. Barbie. Barbie? Trolls? Okay, yeah. A little mermaid. Okay, so, if you actually think about probably most of the movies have that theme. And what that has led to, that thinking is, if who you are on the inside of all matters, then maybe the body doesn't matter. And so we're going to watch an interview now on a college campus in America, in Seattle, when people are being asked the question, is there any differences between men and women? Yeah, so here we have people that are very well educated, but on the question of is there a difference between men and women, they're actually struggling to find any solid answers to that. And it's interesting, at the moment there's a movie called What is a Woman? And this question is being asked all over the place. Uh, it was asked to a woman who was wanting to be part of the American Congress. Um, and she was asked, what is a woman? And she started and then says, I'm not a biologist. Um, the Prime Minister of New Zealand was asked, what is a woman? And he again started and says a whole bunch of things and says it's how you, you know, gender is how you feel. Um, and yet when uh, the guy who does the movie, What is a Woman, like, asks tr people from um, a tribe in Africa, and they're very clear that a woman and women and men are different and have different biology and different, they talk about different duties. And the idea that when they're asked, you know, can a man become a woman, they just kind of, it's just laugh because they have no, they've never heard of that idea, right? Um, so I just want to chat to the person next to you. How would you define what a woman or a man is? All right, does anyone want to have a go? All right, all right, all right. no, okay, we'll, we'll come back to that, I'll come back to that, okay? Because a lot of people can't answer those questions, okay? The first thing I want to say about what the Bible says about this topic is, our bodies are good, our bodies are good, okay? So, if you, if you have Genesis 1 open in your Bibles in front of you, Genesis 1, what you see is you see God talks about everything he makes at each different day and he says at the end, it is good. It is good. And what happens is he finally gets to the creation of men and women and he says, it is very good. And all the way along, what you see is matching pairs. So you have um, the sun being created, but you also God also creates the moon. God creates the land, but he also creates the 
See, yeah. He creates animals that are on the land, but he also creates birds. Yeah, birds, right? So there's constantly he's doing these binary creations. He creates one thing and then another thing. And that's true also of men and women, the last thing he creates. He creates a binary. And the thing about it is, um, all of those things um, don't can't, um, are matching, but they're not the same. And they can't do exactly the same job as their partner. So the sun and the moon are similar, but they're different. It's land and sky, similar but different. It gets the male and female, similar, matching, but different. And when it comes to these differences between men and women, what we see if we look at chapter 126 is there are biological differences. So God made us in the male and female in his image. Male and female, meaning our genders, our, our, the two sexes, which gender and sex, in the biblically speaking, are the same thing, are created by God. And that means um, they're not something that we feel or we decide that we are later on, but it's something that God says we are, and God has a purpose for it, and he says it's very good. And that, that gendered um, aspect to male and female goes right down to our genes. Apparently there's 6,500 genes that differ between men and women. So right down to our bones. Um, and gender is important because it says may, um, male and female created in God's image. So how we image God is related to our gender. In fact, we express the image of God better as we relate well as men and women. Um, now, so there's a question. Um, one, we've got we, men and women um, is different in the way we image God. Men and women are different in the fact that to be fruitful and multiply implies that we need to be different for babies to happen. But then there's a the question, what should it look like? What does it look like to be men and women? Now, first I want to say there's a lot that's the same. So you think about what it means to be godly. Fundamentally, um, men and women do it in the same way. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those are things that men and, men and women should strive to do equally. There are some differences, and those differences tend to be to do with roles, um, particularly within the church and in the family. Men tend to have leadership roles, teaching roles, um, primarily to do with God's word and also care, um, provision, protection. Um, so there seems to be differences in role where, where women are to support the wives, um, for example, in the household, are meant to support the men as they lead the family. But then, when you get right down to it on a day-to-day -day kind of level, what do the differences look like? I don't think the Bible says a lot. Um, so I guess the third thing I want to say about that um, is, yes, men and women express themselves different. Part of that is cultural. Part of that is stereotype. And I think we need to be careful um, before saying men and women should do this or look like this when the Bible doesn't specifically talk about it. The more important thing to know is Psalm 139 says... Um, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And then that, the, the language that it uses is God knits us together in our mother's womb. Now, I don't do cross-stitching. Does anyone here do cross-stitching? Yep, I've got a couple of people, right? Now, I haven't done it. I've seen people do it. But the way I understand it happens is every single part of that cross-stitch is individually woven, right? Like, individually purposed. And that's the way God made us in the womb. We are not accidents, we're not carbon copies, we are hand-stitched in the womb, which means everything about us, um, in terms of our being the gender and the body that we are, is actually handcrafted by God. And so, in other words, we should be thankful for the bodies God has given us. Um, but then we go, well, what does it really look like? The best picture we have, for example, of what a man looks like, is Jesus. Now, some people might say, well... Being a man is not taking an interest in you know, hanging out, like caring for kids. Jesus hung out with children, he cared for children. Being a man um, doesn't mean means you don't cry. Jesus wept when his friend Lazarus died. Being a man means you don't show weakness, but Jesus showed weakness on the cross, right? But, um, you know, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. 
Um, so what, what we see in Jesus is what it means to be a true man, and what he does do is he cares for those around him. He cares for those in need. He, he hangs out with the outsider. Ultimately, he dies for people who don't deserve for his enemies. He takes responsibility for others. So the first thing I want to say is our bodies are good. The second thing is our bodies are broken. Now, <clears throat> over the last couple of days, my daughter Lydia, um, Anastasia has been really sick. Um, she's been vomiting. I was on my way to a lunchtime group at um, Burwell Girls this week, and on my way out, I pick up Anastasia, and she vomits all over. Right? It's, it's gross. Um, so part of being in, in this fallen world, post Adam and Eve sinning, means that our bodies get sick and they break down. Another related thing to that, though, is shame. We experience shame. Before Genesis 3 happened, Adam, Adam and Eve experienced no shame, but after the fall happened, they felt, they saw they realized they were naked, and so they felt shame. And that kind of shame can be a very real ongoing thing for people. Um, we're related, particularly related to their body. They might not be comfortable with some aspect about their body. Maybe it's the height, maybe it's the weight, maybe it's who knows what it is. So another aspect of that is, is um, shame, we feel shame. Now statistics, I've got some statistics. Um, this feeling of shame or discomfort in our bodies apparently is on the rise. So in 2014, 54% of women described themselves as unhappy with their body and 80% said that looking in the mirror made them feel bad. And that was massively on the rise from the previous year. And I think partly that's related to, we have unrealistic expectations. Back in the day, the people you might compare yourself with were your friends, um, that sort of thing. Maybe the newspaper came along, maybe there's an article, you might see a photo of someone. But these days you've got celebrities with insane workouts, um, and they've also airbrushed, right? Um, so the images that you see in the, in the magazines is not actually what they look like, um, but it's a, a, a perfected version of that. And so we have unrealistic expectations. But another reason why we feel shame is because of sin. Romans 7, Paul says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, that means the parts of my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So he says, his, in his members, in his body, sin is dwelling there and it makes him do what he doesn't want to do. And so it's kind of like, I don't know if you've been cold or worse, and you get the trolley, and the, the trolley that you've got is the one with the wheel that never goes right, goes straight, right? And so you're trying to like get out of the door, but it just bangs into the wall constantly. I don't know if you've had a trolley like that, but that's kind of the way our bodies um, now are uh, just impacted by sin. We're meant to go straight, but there are parts of our experience in our bodies where they're constantly veering off the way we didn't want them to go. Even as Christians, we feel that. You know, Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, this brokenness can become very personal. Um, and in particular, some ways it does that is people who might be born with intersex. Now, intersex is where somebody is born um, either with both um, uh, reproductive organs, or there might be a combination of some, some appearance of, of one gender, but um, some um, reproductive organs of another gender. And it is a real thing, it, it affects a very small proportion of people, but it's a real thing, and it's a real struggle for those people who have experienced that. So the first thing to say, um, that is very hard, and it's very real. The second thing to say about that is, um, even if they might um, have different things that make them look different, uh, everyone has a, a particular gender because if you go down to the level of the chromosomes, every intersex person is, has the chromosomes either, either of a man or a woman. The next thing to say is that Jesus talks about this sort of thing in Matthew 19. After talking about marriage, he talks about eunuchs, some who have been eunuchs since birth, and that means without reproductive organs. Um, and Jesus says about them, he says that they are precious, and he also says about them that they can equally participate in the mission of Jesus for the kingdom. And so you might not be able to experience marriage, 
or intimacy relationships in the same way that someone else might, but you can equally be valued by God and participate in his mission. In fact, Jesus was never married, and yet he was the fullest man that ever lived. The next thing is body dysphoria, and body dysphoria is you just feel really uncomfortable with your body, um, and it's related to gender dysphoria, where you might feel either uncomfortable with your body, or you might feel out of, um, out of place in your body. And again, I want to say, it's a very real and painful experience. What, um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm actually colorblind, which means, you know, a whole bit much different colors, like I can't distinguish between them. Now, just because I can't distinguish between different colors, doesn't mean that those colors don't exist. It just means I struggle personally to differentiate between them. And I think this is a little bit about like how we should think about gender dysphoria. Just because you personally might not be able to clearly distinguish your own feeling of what gender you should be, that doesn't mean that those genders don't exist, those sexes don't exist, and it doesn't mean that they're not good things. The related thing to um, gender dysphoria is transgenderism. Now, this became a big thing. The idea of, you know, you can transition a, a biological man can become a woman and vice versa. Since someone called Ka um, Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner back in 2015. Boys, back. And since then, it's become quite popular for um, celebrities to start to look like or identify as the other gender. Um, and this is the same idea, I don't know if you've seen the movie Ready Player One, but it's the idea is there's this place called Oasis in the future, and everyone, pretty much everyone, puts on their VR headset and goes into this other world, and the body they have is completely different to their real world body. They can identify whatever sex, age, nationality, animal, whatever they want, right? Um, this is sort of the way people are starting to think about our bodies. The body is something we're born with, but we can change it if we're not comfortable with it. And it's become quite a political movement. I was watching a video today of um, a 13-year-old girl with her mother with a doctor, and the doctor's um, encouraging her to get, um, to transition genders at age 13. Um, and that, that involved, it involves a certain hormonal process, right? Age 13, and I've heard it much younger than that as well. But here's the thing. The guy that began this, these surgeries in the um, John Hopkins um, uh, University in America, um, 30 years ago, stopped doing it because he realized people's mental health wasn't being improved in the long run. People were saying, I don't feel comfortable, I'm struggling with depression and anxiety. So they did this, the transition, but it didn't actually help. And in fact, 80% of young people who struggle with like gender dysphoria feel comfortable in their um, biological sex by the time they reach adulthood. So if you just allow people to wait till, till they're old enough to be an adult, most people will feel comfortable again in their biological sex. But the more important thing to say is there's nothing you've experienced that Jesus doesn't understand. So there's a passage in Hebrews 4 and it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has, respect has been tempted as we are, but is without sin. Jesus understands what you're going through. He cares. Um, he knows better than anyone else. He's experienced all the temptations and struggles that we would have, and yet he is without sin. So he's not in the same hole that we're in. He can draw us out. So how should we respond? The first thing I want to say is, do not judge others. If, if you are um, using the language of you're gay or uh, what a lesbian or whatever like that, or, or you're stereotyping people because of the way they look or the way they act or express, I want to say that's actually not loving. That's not a Christian way to respond. Um, so we need to be the people that don't talk lightly um, in that kind of way. Jesus hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors and he loved them and he welcomed them into the kingdom. The second thing I want to say is, Jesus has already said, he sees and understands your struggle. So when you, when you might feel isolated, you might come to youth group and say, no one else is experiencing what I'm experiencing. They look like they have it all together. They look like they're comfortable in their bodies. Jesus understands. 
Um, and you can, so you can pray for him, pray to him, and know that he understands and he cares for you. The third thing I want to say is we find our true selves not by following our feelings, but by following Jesus. When our desires don't match up with how we look, just say, look, I don't understand why I'm experiencing this, Jesus, but say, look, I know I can trust you, so help me as I struggle. So don't judge, know Jesus understands, trust him, and remember, you're not alone, he gives you his spirit. So his spirit is the, the person of the Trinity that works inside of us, inside our body, to actually help us to start living God's way. Um, and, and there's a story, on an interview I, I um, watched with uh, somebody who struggled with same-sex attraction, um, uh, and his name was Bryson, um, thought it would help if he transitioned, began, began as a woman, but became a he, Bryson. It didn't help, and then met, met up with a Christian pastor, and said, I don't, and, and this Christian pastor just um, prayed for them and walked alongside them. And then eventually, um, through reading the Bible and going to church, Bryson realized that the thing that was bringing him peace was found in Jesus, not in the gender transition surgeries that, that he was doing. And actually um, shared with the pastor that he wanted to detransition back to being a woman. And that pastor just constantly walked alongside um, Bryson, and the whole church patiently walked with Bryson. And um, it was really hard, like incredibly hard. But um, he talked about the care that he received, but also um, the the encouragement from that Psalm 139 that you you know me, and you need to be in my mother's mother's womb, like gave him so much comfort. And the last thing that gave rise and comfort was that um, Romans 8 says, you know, our, our hope is that our bodies will be redeemed. And so the thing I want to encourage you with as we finish up is one day, whatever struggles you go with, through, well, even the best enjoyment we have in this world, it will be far surpassed by what we experience when our bodies are perfected in heaven. So let's pray that we can look forward to that day. Heavenly Father, I pray that um, we as a community would be a welcoming community, um, but we wouldn't just accept um, what, we, um, what we think is against your desire for people and what's best for people, that we might walk alongside people but point them to the fact that our true self isn't how we feel on the inside, or isn't. Um, it's our identity in Jesus, and um, so help us to talk about the goodness of the body you, bodies you've given us as a gift to talk about how broken um, our world is, but to look forward in hope to the restoration of our bodies too. In Jesus' name, amen.